Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7. We're at episode number 1697 today. Thank you so much for joining me for it. I've got a special treat for you today. Thank you so much for subscribing to the show as well. And thank you also to all the patrons who helped make this possible by joining me at patreon.com slash SW7x7. Today is the first of a two-part interview with Ryan Shore. Let me get this all right for you. Ryan Shore is a two-time Emmy Award and Grammy Award nominated composer, songwriter, music director, and conductor for film, television, virtual reality, games, records, concerts, events, and theater, 60 scoring credits plus, including, for our purposes, Star Wars Galaxy of Adventures and Star Wars Forces of Destiny. And we are going to talk about how those particular music scores get built and you know how the process works from soup to nuts. But we're also going to hear about how Ryan got into the music business in general as well. That's where we're going to start with this first half of the two-part interview with Ryan. Ryan Shore. So I hope you enjoy it and let's dive right in. Ryan Shore, thank you so much for joining me on Star Wars 7x7. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very glad to be talking to you today. And we're going to be talking with you about Forces of Destiny and about Galaxy of Adventures, two very exciting Star Wars animated projects that are on YouTube for Star Wars and also Star Wars Kids, the brand new YouTube channel. But before we get into that, I would love to start by just hearing a little bit more about your background. Um, from you know looking at the internet, which is of course always a potentially dubious situation. You know, I I understand that you did a lot of uh, musical preparation work in the late '90s, and that was sort of your start in the industry. So, could you talk a little bit about just how you got started and what you know the journey has been like leading up to getting involved with Lucasfilm? Absolutely. Yeah, so I started music when I was 11. I started by playing saxophone. And at that time, I was, I got into it because I just thought the saxophone looked cool. <laughs> um, you know, they're the reasons people get into music at the age of 11. You know, I wasn't really thinking about a career. I was just thinking about um, doing an activity, and, and the saxophone seemed neat. Um, I was inspired at that time by things 11 year olds might be inspired by you know like the muppet the, you know the saxophonist from the muppets oh yes <laughs> <laughs> and uh uh and blue lou marini from the saturday night live band um i remember when i saw the blues brothers and saw him walk the bar in the aretha franklin scene i just thought it was the coolest thing ever ah and so i picked the saxophone i later added some more instruments in high school um like the other saxophones um clarinet, flute, piano, and I was just sort of exploring uh, a bunch of everything. Um, I remember when I was 13, I received a, um, a, a keyboard from my, my uncle, Howard Shore. He gave me a, um, a keyboard, and that was the very first time I ever had um, a piano in my house. So it was an amazing time to just be exploring music just sort of on my own and, you know, finding sounds on the keyboard. And um, and then when it came time to uh, graduate high school, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to pursue music oh. um, full, full time. Mm -hmm. I, I was certainly really interested in it. And I was, you know, playing the instruments and I was playing in all the bands and, um, you know, the symphonic band and the, and the jazz band and solo and ensemble type of things and marching band. And I was um, drum major in the marching band. Um, I did all music programs during my summers of high school. So I was, I was really into it, but I had still never really dedicated a hundred percent of my time to it because I was, you know, getting into academics as well. Um, and I had gone to a summer program, uh, when I was in high school at Berkeley college of music, they had a five week program and they, and I loved it. And they were, amazing and very graciously gave me a, a, a really nice scholarship to be able to come back to the school for college. So that sort of made the decision easier in a way because I figured, well, I'll go to Berkeley and if, if I don't like this after a year, then at least I know. And then right. I'll, I'll look at something else. 
So, <clears throat> so I went to Berkeley, and honestly, I never even thought about looking back. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations, like, that's awesome. Thanks. I I just loved it. I was so immersed in playing the instruments and playing in in as many ensembles as I could. Um, in college, out of college, um, I remember when I was in Boston. You know, not only was I playing in like four to six, you know, registered ensembles every semester, but I played as a ringer in MIT's big band on saxophone and a, you know and they brought me into Harvard to play in the Hasty Pudding theatrical group um, and I played at New England Conservatory in their big band under the direction of, of George Russell and I played at Boston Conservatory in their you know symphony because they needed a saxophone so I was just playing all the time but I had to pick a major and I decided to choose film scoring because um, I just figured, well, if you um, if you wanted to be a, an instrumentalist, then you could, uh, if you can play, then hopefully you can get a gig. But having the degree might not necessarily, you know, um, mean the difference. People just want to know you can play. So I figured, well, why don't I major in film scoring and I'll and I'll learn some other stuff. Um, and so that's how I got into scoring. And then when I Graduated from college, I moved to New York City to to work for Howard, uh, and that's how I got into music preparation. Was because he, um, <laughs> the way I looked at it was, he seemed to be doing pretty fine before I arrived, and <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, how can I be of value to to him? And so. Um, I learned to do music preparation and and did that in house and that turned into about four years of work for Howard and then that later turned into orchestrating for him and some music producing and all during that time I was living in New York and I was scoring my own films for the first you know for the first time you know I was scoring um, shorts at NYU and I was also really involved in in records and all um, and then when my own scoring work picked up, then I started phasing out some of the things that I wasn't as interested in doing, like music preparation or all the other things I was doing in the beginning of my career, you know, like mm -hmm. teaching people and, and, and hooking up people's gear and crawling around on my knees behind people's equipment, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know um, just to, doing what I could to, to make a living in music. And then I sort of phased some of those things out and and uh, and eventually was just focused mostly on on composing and so i was in new york for about eight years during that time and then uh, moved out to la probably about 15 years ago and um and that's pretty much been my trajectory when in the, in the beginning um, i was mostly inspired by howard and he was mostly doing film and uh, and so i started pursuing only film uh in the beginning and then later i sort of saw that you know, other people in, in the industry were really doing a lot of different things, like not just film, they were doing TV and virtual reality and games and, you know, other types of things. So I started um, taking on more of those types of projects. And, and, and uh, that's sort of how, how it's evolved. And for um, the lay people, and essentially myself <laughs> included, um, can you briefly explain the difference between um, film uh, preparation and uh, and orchestration and how that relates to the whole process of creating a film score? Absolutely. So um, a composer writes the music and um, and then uh, let's say those are compositions and let's say you could play those compositions on any instrument at this point. Like right now it's just a composition. So maybe you could play that piece on the piano or you could play that with an orchestra or some other instrumentation that you choose. And that's largely the orchestrator's job. The orchestrator's job is taking a composition and translating it to a given instrumentation. Um, so an orchestrator would need to know what all the instruments are capable of doing, what their special characteristics are, what the ranges of the instruments are, how different instruments blend together. Um, and so you can make decisions about how to have a piece of music played by whatever instrumentation is. Um, so the orchestrator is, is, and oftentimes the composer is the orchestrator as well. So sometimes those aren't two different people, but oftentimes they are. Um, 
sometimes just because there's not enough time to orchestrate, you know, with, with film projects, TV projects, sometimes schedules are very fast. So it's helpful to have somebody dedicated to just working on the orchestrations. Um, once the orchestrator creates a, a finished score, like a piece of paper that you can hold in your hands and like, here is a representation of all of the instruments that the, what they're going to play, then the person who's doing music, music preparation, sometimes also known as a music copyist, takes all of that music and and writes it all out for all the individual players, you know, basically transferring the information from the, the, the larger score to all the different players. Okay. And and it's an extremely detailed job. Every single note gets played and it all has to be correct. Um, you know, because time is money in a recording session. And typically on, on a film score there there could be I mean, at least when I was doing it for Howard you know, we would generate somewhere between maybe five and eight thousand pages of sheet music. Oh my gosh! Um, you know, to every clarinet part, every flute part, every piano. You know, it's all of it for forty cues or fifty cues. Um, so for me, that was an amazing way to get into this business because um, even though I wasn't writing the scores, it gave me a feel for what it's like just to process that much music in a way. You know, right. it's like I wasn't I wasn't writing the notes, but at least I, I just I had never sort of I guess process is the right word. Like I had never just sort of worked on something where an hour of music went through a process. Um, and so it was a great way to learn. It was a great way to work with orchestras. It was a great way to learn about Howard, you know, and his writing style and his orchestration style. Um, and so that's what a music copyist does. Thank you very much. And, you know, you talk about deciding that your major, you were going to pursue film scoring. And that seems to be a different uh, path when you consider that your history, you know, growing up and going through school, that you're a multi-instrumentalist. So you're playing, but you're not necessarily uh, creating your own work. And that is, I imagine, what somebody going into film scoring would be doing. So you must have had a sense at some point that you weren't just going to play other people's stuff, that you wanted to create your own stuff. Is that kind of what went into the decision? It, it, it partly went, yes, totally. That That is definitely part of it. Um, I think that the other part was I've always just been really curious about music and different instrumentations and different styles of music and and how music is written, how it's played, how it's performed, how it's recorded. And um, I've just always just had a great thirst for, for knowledge in general. And and what I found was I was playing in all these, these ensembles with the saxophone, but there were just so many other sounds that I wanted to explore that a saxophone wouldn't necessarily be in that ensemble. Um, you know, an orchestra is a good example, you know, even though... There has been some saxophone in, in, in the orchestras. Um, it's traditionally not a regular part of the orchestra. And, you know, there's been saxophone concertos and things, but, but you know, that, you know, generally speaking, most orchestral music just doesn't have saxophone. So, so for me, it was really just a way that I wanted to explore other music. I wanted to, to learn how it's put together and how it's produced and played and recorded. And, and I just couldn't do it by holding a saxophone. So that's why, <laughs> I, started, that's why I started getting into composing. Excellent. And so then how did you end up involved with Lucasfilm and with Forces of Destiny, which I believe was your first Star Wars project? Is that right? It is. Um, it was, yes. The way I got involved was through a company called Ghostbot. And Ghostbot is a, um, uh, a, a production house up in um, the Bay Area, up in the San Francisco area. And they do animation for a lot of different types of projects. And so we had, I was introduced to them through some friends of mine um, who um, were at Pixar. Uh, and, and some of my friends at Pixar knew the, uh, knew the people at Ghostbot and recommended me to them for, um, I think it was like some advertising we were doing. So it wasn't Star Wars related at all. Um, and we did some projects and, and loved working together. And they were the ones who recommended me to Lucasfilm because they, Ghostbot was the, the uh, animation house for, uh, and, and, the, and the creator of um, Forces of Destiny. And so it was funny when they reached out to me, they, because it's Lucasfilm, they weren't able to really say a lot. 
Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so they called me up and they said, "Hey, we're working on a new animated series, and we really can't tell you very much about it, but we'd like to recommend you." Um, and it's for Lucasfilm. And I said, "Oh my God, yes, of course, <laughs> that sounds incredible." Um, and so, but I really didn't know it was Star Wars. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. They asked me to put together a reel. Um, that was the direction I was given was they were looking for adventure music and, and, you know, adventure music could really be a lot of different things. Um, you know, uh, Indiana Jones is adventure. Um, you know, you could say interstellar is adventure, right. um, but these are vastly different types of adventures. Um, or, um, avatar is an adventure. Um, so, I started putting music on the reel, but I really wanted to make sure that I was going to put the right music on the reel. Hmm. Uh, they gave me a chance to speak with the producer of uh, one of the producers of, of Forces of Destiny, and um, uh, she, I still didn't know it was Star Wars, but but she was, you know, I, I was asking her some questions, you know, but what I just said I want to put together the best possible reel, and and um, and I remember <laughs> I remember asking, I said. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to know anything I'm not supposed to know, of course. <laughs> um, however, I just have one question, and and my question is, do these stories take place on Earth? <laughs> 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 and uh, and she said no, and I said, thank you. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> that was all you needed to infer that it was Star Wars, right? I still didn't know it was Star Wars, but I had a guess because it's Lucasfilm. But but mm -hmm. more importantly, it was just like, oh, okay, if it's not on Earth, we're now talking about science fiction, um, right. most likely, um, or science fiction adventure. So I immediately changed my reel and I put things that I thought would speak to that, and um, and then I got the call that they that they uh, wanted me to do it, and that's how it happened. That's excellent. Congratulations, by the way, if I haven't said it already. I think I said it probably before we started the interview, but um, Thank you. <laughs> it's <laughs> so wonderful to end up with. I mean, had you been a Star Wars fan growing up or? Yeah, absolutely. I've seen all the movies and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I, ne I never it it never occurred to me that I would have a chance to work on Star Wars. Um, it, it wasn't something that I ever thought about doing or, or was trying to angle towards doing it. Honestly, it just kind of seemed untouchable. Um, you know, there's very few composers that, that have even written for Star Wars. And of course, John Williams is, you know, the beyond the mass, you know, uh, vast majority of, of the music. So, um, but yeah, I was to totally a fan. Um, and, uh, and I've loved working on them because I, I've, gotten even more into them you know it's it's one thing to sort of watch them and then it's another thing to sort of be a part of the creative process and discuss the episodes um and talk about the characters and um i've, I've absolutely loved it and your bio says that you've actually performed with john williams is that right i have yeah you, it was tell me more it, please <laughs> yeah you know uh well there was another thing that i never expected you know to happen um it was, gosh, when was it? I think it was maybe, maybe in 2012, if I, if I have my, my dates right. Um, and it was here in LA, it was a concert, and it was the Young Musicians Foundation. Uh, they were having a, a, an annual gala concert, and um, John Williams is conducting, and it was all music from, from Williams, uh, you know, many of his hits. Um, but also it was the orchestral premiere of pieces from his then recent films, um, The Adventures of Tin Tin and War Horse, mm. um, of course, both directed by Steven Spielberg. And so this performance was actually um, the first time that, that, you know, film score selections from those movies had been played outside of the recording studio. Um, but they, in addition to doing all of this John Williams um, featured music, there was one suite on the concert and it was, um, a tribute to film composers and there was music from a lot of different uh, famous scores on it and one of the scores that was in the suite was the Pink Panther Oh! and so they needed a, uh, a tenor saxophonist to play it um, of course I, I know the Pink Panther really well the saxophonist I don't know um, but it's Plas Johnson and 
you know, it's an iconic saxophone solo. So um, I received that call, and and uh, the best besides you know being able to play under John Williams' baton. Um, for me as a composer, one of the best parts about those concerts was that um, I got to sit in, you know, for three rehearsals for the concert and, and I only had like 16 bars of music to play. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to sit there in the, or, you know, amongst the orchestra, you know, they, you know, I'm, I'm seated within the orchestra and, and I could just watch um, John Williams conduct his, you know, his, uh, iconic music. Um, and, and, and I could hear, and this was the part that was so brilliant to me was I got to hear how he rehearses the orchestra and how he talks to the orchestra. Um, it, it, the eloquence and, and of his language, um, and sort of the sophistication of the way he'd be able to convey ideas with, with such refinement. It was amazing. So that, that was the, you know, beyond being able to play, just watching him rehearse and, and conduct was incredible. All right, we're going to take a pause right here. And tomorrow we will come back with the second half of our interview with Ryan Shore, who is scoring Galaxy of Adventures and Forces of Destiny for Lucasfilm. And yeah, that's going to be it for our time here from Times Square in New York City, and at least on today's episode. But I want to thank you so much for joining me for it, as always. And of course, may the Force be with you wherever in the world you may be. This podcast is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox. It is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other related Star Wars items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the Force be with them. All original content is copyright 2019 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.